check off some things from leading up to now that will sort of uh, set a right our path so that we're still staying with how is it that Shepherdstown has this you know, continuous uh, kindness, personality, which we all recognize. So first, let's do some dance. Dance is so, you know, um, that she, when she was 15, she had no parents. She's already parents. Think about her development. And she went to live with a fellow who was in New York and one that had a lot of money. And her sister married a man named Mitchell, who was uh, a source of great. She she got help when 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 Stephen was playing dominoes at the A. S. Andrews from him. The family helped out when they, she really needed help because Stephen wasn't that big. But my point is. She think about her development. She then was sent, sent off to good schools where she was number one in the class at the time. But what we're getting at is she was she went on a solitary adventure into becoming who she was and benefiting from her bravery and imagination. She became as fascinating as you found out. So uh We talk about, I love this. I have a lot of letters too, shown nothing about. And she wrote this wonderful handwritten letter to Mrs. Who? Theodore Roosevelt. And this is just so Shepherdson. She said, Miss Roosevelt, I'd like to, I'd like to offer a suggestion that we begin or formulate a society for kindness. That's so fantastic. Right, this is right the first lady and say, we need a society for kindness. What I love about it is this gentle audacity. <laughs> I mean, just this is all I'm thinking about. We need to be kind. That's very Shepherdson. And you heard heard it in the another really big one. If you walk around Shepherdstown and University on a weekend and you're just slightly alert, you know, have survived, like okay, this, you're coming, you're going, I think. Of course, when I knew anyone ever in New York, it was like this, you know, everybody's in their little silo. But there's, I've done this, but there's this little, you do a little test. If there's, if there's a, a willingness to share eye contact, it's all unconsciously quick. But generally, <laughs> You, we all know what I'm talking about. There's this, this you know, a little, <laughs> and if someone's a, a deeply, deeply deranged urbanite, they 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 will shut you down. You know. Uh, anyway, go go to Boston. Then just suddenly know exactly what I'm talking about here. Those winters, you know, freeze them up. Um, I have been painting a picture of these men here as being real warlike, but there was no war for years. This is the next generation. Only the, only the elderly remember revolution. <laughs> and uh, so I, what I'm trying to say is when a war begins, uh, this year, again, unlike Charlestown, Ch Shepherdstown had a lot of Germans who were like, nah, I don't know, you know, it's not my issue, it's all slavery, thank you. You could feel, and well, I say this because for 20 years I had all of the complete roster of biographies of those in the 2nd Virginia Infantry Regiment where all the Shepherdstown guys were in. You see a whole lot of dilatoriness. A whole lot of a wall, a lot of indifference seems to be sneaking out in the records. You know, you see a lot of coming and going and absences and absences and all that. Prisoners of work. Uh, of course, there's people like who is the sheriff in Shepherdstown is the epitome of that warrior. Shepherdstown's uh, falling spring. William Augustine Morgan is the epitome of that soldier. And he was our sheriff after the moment. 
What I'm getting at is I'm trying to I'm trying to reconcile my portrayal of you of these Shepherdstown guys. Uh, they weren't embracing the idea of of the of the war and its causes to people in Charlestown. If you were a young man in any town and you really didn't want it, didn't want to go to war, your parent, no, you didn't know, you wanted to venture, your parents said, please, let's not have this. This is this is right across the county. The moment it's it becomes a hot war, right? You are immediately deprived of a third choice. Okay, it's you know, suddenly when it's a hot war and Turner Ashby's trying to throw you in jail for treason. Locally, or, or taking your property because you're, he's considered considered you a traitor, and he's just freelancing. You see what I'm going? Regardless, it's at a point where you just fall into one camp or the other, or you leave the hell out of the area. You understand? You just and and you were going to go with all the guys that you played with. You know, there's not ideology. You just follow the guys. Okay, just to, I'm trying to show you something. When I saw that hilarious pattern of dilatoriness, I said, that sounds like, that sounds like, okay. And you know how we talk about the inter interconnection between all the families, you know, intermarriage, intermarriage, church, squad, generation after generation. And for those of you who didn't hear me say it, when the Civil War began, it's on your merge, you look at 1860, it says population, I think 15,000, in parentheses, 3,000, 35, something enslaved. That is a total of 18,000. In 1960, the, the, the time when it started changing for what it is today, in other words, newcomers, population now is 55, 60,000. The population is, and 100 years later, about 18,500. <laughs> and the joke is, I've learned that 15,000 is always the number of original families. That was the core. Okay. All that. Now, my point was about everybody being interwoven and close. I said, oh my gosh. Those after the war who live in Shepherdstown. Like Peggy Washington, who, who when Henrietta Benninger Lee was what, seeing him about to burn her house, she said, Ma'am, I think you're going to need this. And she brought us water, a stiff drink, right? That's Peggy Washington. She is a direct ancestor of 90 some odd year old Peggy Grantham here. What I'm saying is, generation upon generations, oh, she was my grandmother's uh, servant, and she was. Oh, she was my midwife. You know, they just they're they're all in the mix too, because they're generation after generation after generation. So here. I'm bringing them into this mixture thing that's so close to bond. All right. I think I managed to derail you enough. Now the Civil War, I mean, after the Civil War. It was about as timeless and quiet right until 1960 in its own different with the changes. Then it was chaotic, historic, monumental, and unnerving and hellish before the Civil War. And I think a lot of people were happy about that. I heard Toni Morrison say this. She said, I grew up in a very ethnically diverse town in Ohio. And this is so true. We had no money. And for 30 years after the Civil War, I can assure you, nobody had. Poor Dancy did not know that Stephen A. that the damages had no money. They were poor, but they had no money. So think of the Depression and think of those 30 years of recovery. That wonderful phrase of Tony Morrison, we have to remember it. We had no we had no money, but we didn't think of ourselves as poor. Let's bring that back. Nobody thought of themselves as poor or inferior because we had great friends 
shared memories for generations, family, nature. Boy, they are so connected to nature. The dance is starting to show you. Uh, picnics, Sunday services, Saturday night in Shepherdstown, and whiskey, uh, lot berry mash, and brandy, fried eels scraped out of the fish pot, and of course, uh, opiates were not at all illegal until 1914. They were a common thing. It's called self-medication. Any veteran, anybody had a lot of baggage, and dance would include it, you know. It was not, it was not unseemly. It was part of the deal. You have to understand, totally un, no prescription required. But, but you see, so, something around the 1920s, we, 15, so we got really into rules, but not then. And so those 30 years, now, and in the Depression, by the way, let's forget the loud for a second. I, I know that I miss, I miss a few facts here. You had family, you had friends, you had nature, you had pictures, you had food, not a problem. You didn't need a nickel to own a hawk. I mean, likewise, in the rest during the Depression, Jerry Thomas, the professor here at Sheppard, said the, the county asked for little or no federal relief. Only county in West Street because they had abundant farms and nobody really was hungry. You know? And a very good example is this. Remember, I pointed out a house, it's a, a little tiny, charming house, very old, at the southeast corner of Mill and Pine. Well, that was the home of Azzy and John. She was a midwife, he was a laborer, and three children, and one of whom I spent a couple of hours interviewing when he was in his 90s, John Wesley Harris. He was the teacher for many years in the black school. He said Shepherdstown was good for, for us. He said it was good, better than any other place we could be. So where I'm going with this is John. Uh, they had two 200 pound hogs, even in the property of this teeny little house, and they would butcher two 200 pound hogs in the fall. I know, vegetarians, please, you know, your plugs. And that would last them until summer. And he knew how to do it, he knew how to dress it. We were told you to comprehend this, you know. And he knew how to do the casing for forgiving for the intestines. Blah, 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 blah. That was just common knowledge. He, they just knew how to do it. This is stuff that's like way beyond their comprehension. And remember, I said he didn't need money. He had a good reputation. He had a good hard labor at Azzy. He came from a family that worked for the shepherds. Very Again, the picture of her so elegantly dressed. Uh, they were offered an opportunity to buy their house. Three kids, two parents, and they a little bit more. And the guy said, about 1915, I'll give it to me for a thousand. The bank probably wouldn't have given it to them because of you know, all the stuff. But there was a savings and loan association, George Belts, who were people who were much more supportive of them, who gave them a lower rate. And this was going to chill up your spine. Paid completely in seven years. All paid in seven years. Man, with no down payment. Things have changed. We've gotten into this enormous credit loop that we have not realized has gotten so out of hand. Doesn't that give you something? Wow. That's a great portrait of not needing money. All you need is friends, family, and so on. Yeah. Now we're just going to do one. We're starting to go now. That gives you, that, that fills a lot of gaps of where we're going.
So Jim, what, what separated Shepherdstown? Because they were rural at that point still and, and, and relatively far um, centric from like other towns in the area that okay. didn't do as well. Okay. Yeah, this, okay. From 17, the early 1700s until 1786, it was the only county village. Okay. okay. And Martinsburg was just starting out okay. in 1772, but still, it was small. It was, like, it was even 40 years behind us. We had all this maturation. It was 40, I mean, look at this 1734 to 1786 for Charles, like 50 years of becoming something. So, but the great thing about Charles Sun is it gives us a great counterexample. You know, it really had a whole different vibe. And if you, it's there, you know. Uh, and also, we, we were, were, we were very far. And they were German farmers, not big, big, big productions. But you have to understand, and all through the 1800s, two counties grew more wheat. I mean, they grew routinely, about in Jefferson County, a million bushels of wheat every year, year after year, and nothing's close in all of West Virginia or Virginia. So it was wealthy. Food wealthy. Europe needed our flour for years and years and years. So let me get back to the key thing here. You notice how I've been making this deal about how humble and calm and copy genial and not showy the West West there. And you go, well, Jim, who built that big fancy building in the middle of Jeff Shepherdson? I mean Shepherdstown, who did it? It certainly wasn't the resident of Shepherdstown, right? Because they're all humble. Uh, <clears throat> I have a confession to make. The man who built it lived in a little house that was after they dismantled Shepherd Fort there, those big stone walls, and before they built the big fancy house. And that was where he was born. And he was Reason, R-E-Z-I-N, Davis Shepherd. There's just one little difference. You look at that building, and obviously it didn't come out of the farm how much corn you could sell. He was one smart fella, and I think I like to think he had a good heart too. Um, when he died in December of 19, 1865, he was in New Orleans, where he'd been most of his life. He was basically a sh uh, importer exporter, shipping things from Britain to New Orleans. But his obituary said he, Mr. Davis Shepherd, had the most productive estate that's ever appeared in the world's poor estate. If he died, the most productive and largest estate. And so that's how you get your Trinity Church built. He came back to live. In his last days. That's how he had a huge donation to the town for the poor. He was very flinty, but quietly generous. And you know, <laughs> this is love. This is really you know, when you suddenly think about it. You go reason. So here we have this building that belongs in the middle of a large cosmopolitan city, and not here. Say, what are you thinking? It's got is is one one architect said this building is 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 a florid, florid uh, Georgian revivalist style, verging on Italian. It sounds like a cat cardinal sin, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But if you, Johnny Allen said they threw oh, they threw everything at it. That's where architectural start. It, it has. Curly cues and doodads and Corinthian this and Corinthian that and pedimentos and plasters and lintels. They threw everything at it. What happened to the humility, Jim? Uh, but do you know what? We are so lucky. It became the county government. 
because when the war ended, the famous John Brown courthouse was nothing but a roof that was not a roof, but blue sky, and the first floor was a, a, a well-used cesspool. And as, as some observer wrote, it was cursed. And, and here is this building just waiting to be occupied when the war ended. I mean, there's something uncanny about this, but that's only half the story. I think, I think David Shepard was a savvy enough business person that this is, you know, it's so true. You build something as fantastic as that, build it and they will come. It's genius. Something will happen good. And you, what happened? Come on, what happened? Shepard! <laughs> That was Shepherd College. I mean, you gotta love this guy. Huh? He had something like that's that sixth sense, you know. Build it and they will come. So here's Joseph Merton, and here's Lily Perrigny. That's all they had. They had little they taught right behind uh, kind of where the visitor center is now. That's all it was. And now in 17, 1871, there was it wasn't a pretty good structure, it was a counter-revolution, and the old political power structure kind of got that got the votes again. West Virginia as well as in the world. So definitely West Virginia. And, and for that five year period from 65 to 71, if you were actively and provably fighting for the Confederacy, you were barred from holding any public office. Uh, sometimes if you gave an oath of loyalty, that would do it. But you were, you were out of the mix, but by 1871, it was uh, wearing off. And Charles Sam managed to get get the, the, the gig back. They physically came and tore, took off with all the books. <laughs> so that's why we get along so well. Um, was, there a, was there a debate about whether Shepherdstown or Charlestown would become the county seat? Yeah. No, no, because you always look to any for a centrally located town. And we were too far on the, on the right, edge of the right. south. And this was, but we had a beautiful building Thanks to Davis Shepard, it's uncanny intuition. But you see that, so it, it had a real function in help the economy for about six years. A lot of weird people who came to town and, and can't you picture it? it? Every little town after the war, all the veterans would sort of be sitting somewhere near the courthouse all day. And we had all our guys kind of sit. And I, I read somewhere that one part of the wall was where the white guys were, and the other part up here was where the black folks were. But everybody's, everybody's hanging on the wall. And you see all this. This was happening in Charleston, too, when, when it got rebuilt. When the old veterans are there, and they're symbolic of something, and they got little twitches in one arm, some one leg, and this and that. And it's, they're just telling stories. You know, it's, it's exactly the image. 1871, we now have the world's biggest white elephant. And once again, Shepherd Brooks in Baltimore, I mean Boston, the owner, signed it in the state of West Virginia to become a United State. It's just everybody knew their role. We got the good principal, we got teachers, and 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 I obviously, ladies and gentlemen, it succeeded. <laughs> but it was only in that building. So that's a huge boom for us. We became a place that had Chautauquas. You all know what those are. We were just a bright, bright location for annual Chautauquas. Um, gosh, as usual, I covered far more than I ever mentioned. <laughs> Let's have some questions, please. Just throw something up. I can answer too many questions. Oh, oh, here's the thing. You had this, you never think of this, all of this quiet, you know everybody, you could eat, it didn't matter how much money you did that, somebody did that money. And people felt safe to be what? Themselves. <laughs> the most fantastic thing anyone told me was this. Charlie Owens, I know, I know some of you know, okay. Charlie Owens died probably when I was still here. This I'm, I'm fast forwarding, but it fits the whole sweep of 100 years. How everyone was so comfortable. And I will never use the word eccentric. 
because if you live too long enough, there's too many. It becomes it becomes pointless. I mean, I knew I knew a woman who should, I'll just say her last first name, Virginia. I'm getting back to what Charlie says. Conformity versus being yourself, and how Shepherd's Town, uh, you know, square that. Uh, I visited Virginia Reyes, where she's a retired nurse. She had a little house right there, Long Island Cemetery. And she said, Jim, the reason I never got married. Because I never wanted, I didn't want to spread around the wall for blood. <laughs> See, that's that's authentic. <laughs> she scarcely even knew me. Now you love these people who are just them. And I, another one I gotta do it. Is a, you know, the, you never met the two little elderly couple who dug the graves by hand for years at Elwood Cemetery. Man, she was incredible. And I gave tours for the feds that came down to clearing back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. She, she'd always come out and greet them. And I, I forgot her name, but I said, what, what was the most difficult job you ever had? I see the photographs of them with the shovels. She goes, well, I reckon it was the lumber mill. <laughs> and then when the mechanics, I just, this, this is what I'm saying, it's strength, it's not oddity. When the car, car guys were, were pushing her away and not fixing her car, and it was snowing, and her husband was too shy to say anything, <laughs> she called him up and she said, Mister, I want you to know that I'm a businesswoman. <laughs> I love living here. And Virginia, I, I'm jumping around, we'll get back on task here. I'm going back to Charlie, I did forget. But there's so many. Uh, I'm sitting in Virginia's house, and there's those classic little, there's always that little table with the mints in it, you know, and the house is always the same. And she has a little coffin. What? Oh, a coffin. Yes, yes, I know, I sure, I know. And there's a coffin right there amidst all the doilies and everything. She's open it up. <laughs> really? So go ahead, open it up. <coughs> it's, it's July. So I opened it up. You know, you know what's inside? Santa Claus. <laughs> Listen, folks, you're just getting introduced. <laughs> this is a fascinating place, but that's strength. Charlie said to me this. He said, Jim, oh, this is a very sophisticated man. His father owned, did Owens Pharmacy for years and years in the 20th century. I think it's what grapes and grains is. But Charlie was such a good artist. He was the creator of Rome. It was a big deal. He was an artist. And he came home because his father died. He, but that was fascinating. People went away and came back. But anyway, he says this to me. First, some people see things and have an eye. Some people see it and don't see it. Charlie had an eye. And he said, Jim, you don't understand. Back in Shepherd's Town in the 1890s, everybody was a con man. Everybody was a con man. He's dead in his there. So. Christian, Christian Reinhardt, he had that store where uh, he had the store where uh, Graves and Grains and the other one there. And he was, he said, he was really concerned about the streets of Sears and Robot to mail his business, mail order. He had a store. And he talked, Charlie said, so what he did, he said, he said, town's full of con, right? 1890s, 1900. And so he, he uh, puts an ad in Sears and Roebuck. Completely metal bicycle, 25 cents. And he gets tons of 25 cents. And so what does he do? There's a tinsmith still in town. <laughs> Rolls out the tinsmith and he bangs out these silhouettes of bicycles. How come here? So now you're getting a taste of shepherd stuff. If you leave people alone, they're going to get very rich in a personal way. I could go on and on, but uh, let's just say George Canoe, who I have all recordings of these. Uh, he was 90 years old when I knew him. We talked to him for hours in the 18, I mean, 1985. Principal of the Shepherd's Elementary School, which was the uh, on the corner, the northwest corner of King and High. And he said, he said, 
Jim, Jim, I've always contended that Shepherd Town has more eccentrics per square foot than anywhere else on earth. So, you know, he wants to know. Now, I've kind of stirred the pot and thrown things at you, but the main point is to just sort of savor that. These people aren't even aware of the difference. And what Charlie said, and this is what tied it all together. Jim, as soon as we had roots, that edgy difference, except that, that edgy personality went away. Because the young boys all want to be on the campus. Or all the girls on the three, Scarlet and Mary. Or they won't go back to one of the others. They all started becoming conforming to a popular culture image and losing their. I think so much I can't imagine how far down that road we've gone. Okay, that's where John is going. I know I've been wandering around, but the key things you see, you know, um, try me out with a question. I can tell you about the economy, I can tell you what went away, what emerged, all that kind of stuff. I can take your questions. Leave it with you. Have a question? I've noticed over the years that we have a uh, High per capita population of blacksmiths and woodworkers and timber framers and right. furniture makers and all these artists and craftsmen, at least in my lifetime. No, you're right. I wonder if that's a thread that's gone back in history that you've seen. I think you're totally right. That's one of the best things that's happening now. The craftsmen, this, see, this is what I'm looking for. Is if I just dabble on and on, you're just going to get pieces. Before the, the Civil War, if you look at the census, Weaver. Jacob Winter Mortar, uh, instead of being a craftsman, became a haberdasher, which is where Emma Jays is. And uh, I think the records people eventually just kind of faded away and increased his pottery. These were things you could get from up elsewhere using the train and Sears and Roebuck. That's what wiped it out. The craftsman clocks, even, even Jacob Crafts clocks, he was down, he had the building where, which is on the South east corner of Prince, I mean, yeah, Princess of Germany, <clears throat> master clock, clock maker. So, I guess the point is, those great craftsmen was in it's in the air, it's that German thing. And that famous quote that Dansky Danders had before the revolution if you came to Shepherd's Staff, you could find a wedding dress or a church bell. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. I think you're right. I think that. That's what I like about it. When you see Scott Cable's work, here's a guy that I, he's, just, he's great with metal. And you don't know where, I can't tell you where it is, but there's a place where he has this almost huge dragon with all the metal nuts and bolts and everything and the lips and the tongue and everything. That's Scott. And that's what I do with my off time. It's here in the timber frame folly. So they picked up the set and brought it back. That is the good news of the last 40 years. You know, the, you know, I don't want to say the word hippie because I, I have it in my blood, my hair stays short. Um, it's I, I'm thrilled to that. In the 70s, wait, let's let's address this. 60s, well, uh, Deborah, you held me. I was not here in the 60s, and you very kindly said it was very, very not the right? It was very different. Jeffreystown was very different. It was just a sleepy little quiet town. My aunt lived over sort of across from Elmwood Cemetery on Fair, Fairfax, whatever street it was, Fairmont. over there, Fairmont. And I came back here when my mom got really sick and they thought she was going to die. So they sent me back here to spend summer with my aunt and cousins. I met a, lot, a whole bunch of other people around here. But I came from a metropolitan area. I came from Phoenix. You know, <coughs> it was, it was, New York. It was it was mini skirts and surfer crosses and, and radio stations on 24 hours a day. And I got plumped back here in Shepherdstown. Thought I died and gone somewhere else. Okay. I mean that that wore off, thank goodness, because I, I love it here. But it was very, very different. I mean, it was just this sleepy little quiet town with nothing, really nothing. There's no better words. Nothing going on. Um, 
you know, it, there was nothing going on. The radio station, the closest radio station was in Greencastle, Pennsylvania, and it went off the air at eight o'clock at night. <laughs> Want to go to the bank? There was the there was the bank down here. Lowe's had the bank, and where the brick yellow brick bank, like yeah, that. Yeah, that okay. The, Martha the Jane and I remember, and that was the bank. And the vault is still in there. <laughs> They've never taken it out, and it is awesome. Um, but that was the bank. But if you wanted to do any shopping, like you know, Sally needed a dress, or Susie needed material to make something, we had to go. Martinsburg, Charlestown. Martinsburg was interesting. Yeah, it was, it was a big deal back then. It, and, it, and Martinsburg, I, it's very sad. I, it, it almost makes me want to cry when I go to Martinsburg now because Martinsburg was nice back then. Well, the, the shopping mall sort of sucked out it, it, downtown. It, it, it did. But this was before the shopping mall. And so downtown, there was Julia's Restaurant, who's a relative of my husband's. There was Ireland's, there was Emmert's, there was Cohen's Men's Shop. There were ladies, you know, hat shops and things like that. So well, we had to go to Martinsburg to, to do that. You know, if Becky wanted groceries, of course, my uncle Bud was retired Navy. She would drive down to Bethesda, the commissary. Oh. There were no grocery stores here. There were no grocery stores here. It was a pretty unbelievable. It was the A&P store in Martinsburg and the other one out there on Winchester Avenue. I don't remember the name of it. Um, but yeah, we had, we had to go to Martinsburg. What always tickled me was that in Martinsburg, on Wednesday afternoons, everything closed. Everything closed. Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday afternoon. Why Wednesday? Thanks. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no <laughs> thanks. Everything <laughs> closed. They accept the rules. Right? And if you wanted any business, quote unquote, done, you went to Julius downtown and that's where Boyd's Steakhouse is now and thank goodness they have not messed up the inside mm -hmm. it still has all the dark walnut oh, I know, I in love there that place. Oh. with the little lights that yes. come out over the tables in the back of Julius on Wednesday afternoon there was this huge big round table and back there sitting around that table you would find the bankers the lawyers mm -hmm. with their bourbons, <laughs> their cigars, and their cigarettes, <laughs> and that's where the business yes. in Martinsburg. And that's it. That's, that's so where it's bank. Wednesday, Wednesday, after, Wednesday afternoons, mm -hmm. back to Julia's restaurant. That's where awesome. all the business Thanks. in Martinsburg, all the politics, everything took place. I mean, Others, uh, I mean, I know Martha's. It was this was very, it's Shepherd's Town was very different in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. so. Saying with that, you reminded me of Jim Gift, who grew up here, spent his whole life here. So, you know, Jim, in the 50s, I could get in my car and go to Sharpsburg and invite all the way to Hagerstown on a Saturday and not see another car. No, this ain't the 50s. It's the 50s. Wow. Yeah, quiet, sleepy, and all that. And remember, if you're in Shepherdstown, you've known everybody like Generation over generation, there's nothing to say. It doesn't need to be articulated. So if you're new, it's just what I love is is uh, there was this is even when I was here. Uh, a police report said ran over black uh, saw a black snake on the road ran over saying. <laughs> no <business. laughs> yes, I'm wondering. I mean, there's a lot of population moving into Shepherdstown in the area. Huge. Yes, including us. And I wonder what kind of impact you've seen. Because, I, I mean, our development is brand new. It's been going on for a while. I wonder if that's impacting the culture of the town or people of the just sort of. This is really interesting. You know what? Those of us who kind of come and gone here. The first reaction is, oh, it must be because, because of college. It gave it a boost, but it didn't have that kind of free thinking, creative nature that was always sleeping in there that comes from decades of safety and, and your church's endless support. You know, um, I came 
And I came in the okay. RZLs, as far as I'm concerned, for sycamore pottery for, among that first wave of newness, who are first rate potters. They came in the mid 70s. That's how I see it. And then Dorothy McGee and Carlos, you know, fancy people. Dorothy's father was the ambassador to Germany at Kenya. Big fancy people there. But it started attracting very sophisticated people with a cultural bias. And that was Peter Tompkins who brought me here. He wrote The Secret Life of Plants and all of that. That's what I see coming in. They, okay, this is interesting. I talked to Dow Benedict. Anybody who knows Shepherd Dow Benedict is a key, key person in developing oh, Shepherd in our years. Oh, yeah. Still around. And I said, Tell me the difference between Charlestown and Shepherdstown. And everybody noted this all at Vanity. It was key. It was Keith Knost, who was a very, very high end interior decorator who, who had the yellow building that's now, you know, it's next to the end of it. And he was gay. And what Dow said to me, he's had a long talk with folks in Charleston. He said, we talked it over. He would, he would have never been accepted in Charlestown. Charleston has a way of saying, no, this is ours. And I, truth, truthfully, I've had seen it for years. Uh, the old family is holding on. And I mean, I'm glad to hear it, but there's something, some, some things that are new. I had a, woman, a friend of mine who was retired fed, very high rank, went to Charlestown 10 years ago. From, who lived here and asked to see if there's any employment possibilities. The person said, well, we don't hire anybody with a hyphenated last name. <laughs> That's not Jefferson. But Keith started a new wave and then comes uh, Kevin Connell on the Yellow Brick Bank. He brings that high, high end of sophistication. Martha, you guys know this. That's when things started rolling. And then the next thing that happened is my little Bavarian here comes these sophisticated people. And I remember that Carol Austin said, when Erwin said, come here and start with restaurants, and I saw it, she said, I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> Here's your change right here. I'm hitting on it, but these are the, these are the pioneers. And uh, Pam Berry got, got a very amusing dust up because she was quoted in a, in a major newspaper. Pam Berry, Rusty Berry, renovated the opera house, made it a movie theater again. They had a very good restaurant down the street. They do sweet, uh, sweet shop, but they really changed many things. Or Pam said, we just wanted to bring a little civilization. <laughs> and boy, she got pummeled for saying that, but it's, it was true to it. Anyway, ask me about anything. Oh, I have a question. Yes. Um, so, Mark, did you have your hand up? Huh? Here. Yeah. You put it up here every day. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it, the population of Jefferson County has roughly doubled since 1980, right? You you We're have 60,000 now. Yeah, and it was 30,000 in in your chronological chart there. So my question is, it, the African American population was a, what a little over nine percent in 1980. Where is it now? Um, I I'm one of those people who when I go to get the food line. I, I feel good when I see people in different places. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a strong presence here in Shepherdstown and Charlestown. The largest membership of the NAACP in the whole state is from our county. Mm -hmm. So, it, but if somebody said, a typical person will come and say, well, why, why are everybody going to the same church? That's what we did. What's, what's the matter? The answer is the Blackstone Trust is a nation. <laughs> And their sanctuary of all. Um, Tony Morrison said this, and James Baldwin said this. I'm just so tired of the white gaze, the white gaze looking at it. And James Baldwin said, I'm always tired of the little white guy on my shoulder. That's what the Sunday church is. And they're powerful. It's got a powerful identity. So there's an old joke I told Pastor Lyles, and it's doing really very well. He said, uh, I said, Pastor Lyles, you don't let him go until you're finished, right? 
but that's I'm sure touching it's healthy. Um, and we like seeing more people. I have two little Mark, 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 and she's in my video. You might see her right now. Uh, say that again. Uh, the church attendance stats. Uh, at least how many attend. Rima said we've always been a well church camp. That's a 90 year old in the 1980s. And there has been this evangelical creep here. That's all I wait the Covenant Baptist Church. I'm not going to criticize it, but because it has a certain power. <coughs> we were very, we had like six churches in Shepherdstown, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it is sort of again, 1880s, everything was, nothing got started. Everything was frozen and asleep until about 1880. St. Agnes Church was built in 1880. Um, the Lutheran Church had a huge church that burned down on the other side of the railroad track. Five, they built the Lutheran Church, which is right in the center of town. Presbyterian Church has always been huge and active for a long time. Uh, Trinity, you know, they're all healthy. Uh, but the Covenant Baptist Church back in the 80s was the first of this sort of outsider evangelical thing. And it still has a power, it has to be recognized. Um, if I came into a community when I came in the 80s, I would tell somebody, if you can join some kind of organization, you're not you're going to be wandering around the outside of everything unless you can, unless you join something. It doesn't have to be a church. But I think we're fantastically <laughs> we're always so engaged it's impossible. There are so many places to join is one of our secrets, and another secret is that we have so many affordable public performance spaces. That's a secret power there, like the other uh, train station. And the train station is a result. You hit a point here, Jim. The new people see it's how wonderful it is, and all the others just take this not forever. But there, they see what how good it is, and they become very, very supportive. The train station was in shambles. Jack Snyder is a real railroad expert, author. Knew how to do it. He's still here. Lunch with Senator Bird, what do you want? And Jack made that all beautiful train station, got all the federal money. People come in and go, people with skills, the least of which is not uh, adhering the contemporary American manifesto. Oh, Jamie. I have two, two anecdotes relating to an earlier thing you said that might spark some conversation. But when you said that Keith knows Kind of changed, brought in some different types of people to separate sound. This is keep going. But what I think it was, it's sort of like, oh, he's gay. Yeah. yeah. All right, whatever. So this, these anecdotes relate to this, to that exactly. Which is, my grandparents who were from Hagerstown, Williamsport, on my dad's side, who my mom married. Hagerstown, her name? Yeah, the Byrons, no, the, the Tannery. Oh yes. Williamsport Tannery. Yeah, yeah. They, they moved here so, because of Keith Nose. My grandmother moved here because she loved Keith Nose and his shop so much. He had these wonderful Christmas displays yeah. every year that they, I guess they paper up the windows for a few high days. End, and then, very high end. And, uh, and she just loved the shop and she was getting tired of, of kind of high society in Hagerstown was getting, I guess, kind of catty and, and shallow. And so one, one thing that happened in Hagerstown that my aunt told me was that Joe and John, people know Joe and John, John Matthews in the, on the corner of, and I think John passed away recently, maybe. It wasn't Joe. Yeah, an elderly. Uh, uh, Joe uh, passed uh, away. Yeah, they had the little Boston Terrier or something. <laughs> they had antique stores here in town. Yeah, they did antiques as well. And that's how they knew Keith Notes. And they, they were all kind of part of this. They're from Hagerstown as well. And there was a point in time where 
they kind of got blackballed from the from the the high society social scene in Hagerstown, just because I guess this maybe the evangelicalism was was well, on its, it's way just up. A little whispery thing, and a whispery thing of of finally it made a difference that they were gay. And my grandmother was best friends with Joe and John, and um, she started to blackball the blackballers, and she would <laughs> write letters to all of her friends and say. Hey, Joe and John weren't invited to this party. Don't go. We're going to this other party instead. <laughs> and so they they had this falling out with with Hagerstown High Society. So Keith Nose opened up in Shepherdstown, and my grandmother was like, "Well, we're getting out of Hagerstown. She, you know, they're starting to retire." And they came here instead. And Joe and John were <clears throat> bought a house within I think two years of that here. And a few other people followed them as well because they're just getting tired of what it was like in Hagerstown. And so my my other grandma her. Her mom, you know, kind of knew this, and she was from Martinsburg and married to Shepherdstown man, my grandfather. And we were watching a document on PBS about the Stonewall riots one night. My grandmother was evangelical and kind of had a, a you know, a little discriminatory yeah, attitude generation. Towards, yeah, towards towards gay people, but she was also in musical theater and opera. So half her friends were <laughs> <even> more <laughs> gay men. And, and these two things in her mind did not fit together, like one was stored here, one was stored here, right? She had tons of gay friends and it wasn't, she was 92 and we were watching this PBS documentary and she started to see the struggle of the men in, in Stonewall in New York City and around the country that this documentary was highlighting. And she started to put these things together in her life. And she was like, you know, I think, I think this couple in Shepherdstown when I was in the Snyder house, I think they might've been gay. Oh, and I think these two men were gay too. <laughs> it's like she never put it together that these these friends, you know, these, these groups of, of men who are friends, and she uh, and she finally put it together. It's like this little empathy opened up that night, and she said, you know, I do recall. And she grew up in Martinsburg. She was like, I do recall my grandmother always saying that Shepherdstown was a bit queer. <laughs> when Charles John, when Charles John takes the bus, there's a bunch of spacey reenactors. <laughs> and but they're no they're, but we're fun. <laughs> One other thing, and, and I want to say two things. Uh, ben Schley told me, if she saw my email, Ben Schley went fishing with Jimmy Carter, Howard Hughes. He he was he was he was the one who started the fishing we boy back. Ben Schley did that. He's from Shepherdstown. And he was very loved, a wonderful man. And he said to me, This is the best it's ever been here. This is, see, this is this re renaissance you're talking about, that acceptance and kind of. And he said, Before this, Sam Skinner owned a big orchard. It didn't happen a piece of wine. So you had that. And there was a time uh, just before I came that we had a wonderful little lady, Audrey, and she was the mayor. But Tom Kelch said to me, you don't understand, Jim. All the financial records of Shepherdstown are in Audrey Eagle's purse. <laughs> it's all a different world. But let me get to my point. Yes, Jim, get your point. If you ever knew who Larry Dreschler was, this guy, there's never been anything like him. He was a gentleman. He was Dignified, there's not a thing you couldn't touch that could turn into art. He was played by ear, piano, a mainstay in the Presbyterian Church. You know, make all those little drawings, they could well, any, any, there's so many things. And this was Randy Tremont fought for years. The Presbyterian Church with all its qualities. <coughs> Years ago, all of us could not get their head around, around this issue. And Larry Dressler just couldn't, you know, he did everything for years. He just had to leave. He left him. Okay. But that was a great battle. Randy kept fighting, and he finally, somebody said he almost lost his, his position, but he fought, I think, because of the memory of Larry. So everybody, you know, sometimes people are just stuck and yeah, so what? <laughs> Anyone else? Is this a, is this interesting to some of you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the subject of the churches and the, all these churches, um, 
So I came, I moved back here for a while in 1980, 79, 79 80, when my father passed away. And um, Vincent Gus from the Lutheran Church, which is where my family had gone for many oh, generations. Very hard, so okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, came and asked me if they had just started up the Good Shepherd, Good Town, right. good news, good, the Good News people. Mm -hmm. And I had just given up my journalism career in Salt Lake City, and I had a journalism degree and all that. And um, he said, would you edit this paper for us? No, no money or anything. That's great. So, um, so I was kind of floundering, and I was working, but I didn't really wasn't doing anything I wanted to do. I said okay. So they had, so the board of the original Good News paper was I think it was six ministers, black and white, but there were thirteen churches involved because they had outliers. You know, they had mm -hmm. each of these ministers had. I can't remember all churches right now, but they all had well, these country well, churches. Well, yeah, these newspapers yeah. yeah. all online. Yeah. You know where to look. Yeah, so um, that's what I remember. And so they took care of setting up the food banks, all these ministers all together. They really covered everybody in in the area. And um, so we just ran it in, and uh, Randy was the yeah. main op-ed person. Well, Randy was a key but, force of change. Here. Yeah. yeah, he wrote, he wrote all, he kept that going. But they all contributed, and um, it was just a good newspaper. It was about, there was an article, on, I wrote an article on Larry Drexler. Yeah, so you remember how special he was. Yeah, and um, people just wrote, um, and then Garth's mom, uh, Quinneth Jansen, right. was sort of the town poet. She was a beautiful poet, and she put mm -hmm. her things in, and Ed Zonheiser, and all these people yeah, who had talents just contributed. And it was all free, and um, I think I think that pulled a lot of people together. But I just wanted to mention that because there were, I, I remember there were thirteen different congregations involved in this. That, that's, that's where I, that was the moment I came in '83, and I fortunately fell into the Presbyterian Church. And Randy, Randy, uh, I went to an editorial meeting, and the next morning I had an article. <laughs> well, yeah. 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 Uh, I babysat for Justin's on and uh, you got there. Well, I want to mention one, and there were Please. almost as many bars in town as churches. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> that's there were a true. lot of bars running at the time, yes. and there were a lot of churches. That's oh, 1860 <laughs> 72 Club. Yes. Wretched. Yeah, oh, yeah. the rest. It must be said, Benita Keller's famous quote Shepherdstown is a town of a, it's a drinking town with an art club. <laughs> I mean, the younger people will know right away what I'm talking about, but uh, it's just what it is. It has to be, remember all those years, it was Packwoods Ford, it was Antler, and Great Western, and they're all, and it was all, it was all, you know, hospitality. Uh, what happened to the bars? Uh, I mean, we don't have them. Well, you have, look, Mecklenburg, we all know, yeah, well, the Meck is a pub. That's it, it's a subtle point, it is a pub. Oh, and also, okay, when you see, you go out 45 and you see Doors, Jan and Doors, and Altos, Jan and Doors was a reaction to integration. You know, they went to a private club, so they didn't have to get everybody. Because they didn't want to have to stay. It's not cool mm -hmm. that. And, and it, so it was a struggle for some. And also, the reason, the breakthrough on the, on the, uh, the newspaper, and the moment I was having breakfast and had dinner a week, and I saw one of them on the Next to my table, I knew this is a different place. Everybody writing and writing well, not being paid. Another tradition here. Being paid is not part of it. You notice some knowing laughter here. That's one of our secrets. Don't wait to get paid. Um, but Randy, what happened is Randy comes in and he just he just flaunted his hippie credentials with a big beard and everything, or sandals, you know. Uh, but he Connected with Bob Judge, who was yeah. a real Jesuit, a serious Jesuit, but that's a good Catholic church. And Bob was cool. When Bob came on, everything happened. Fascinating. It's all people making things happen. And one of the great beauties of Shepherdstown is they don't shut out the food company. You just say, okay, whatever. We just don't burn anything down. <laughs> Anyone else? I do have to say, when I moved here and 
group and we started, you know, running me in, the town was incredibly gracious. <laughs> they were. They were incredibly gracious. Um, as a business owner, I had a seat on the visitor center board. No, no, and, no, no. This is the owner of quite a while, Thomas Shepherd. Yeah. And you know, we moved we moved here from from New Jersey, and heaven forbid, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, the town was marvelous, absolutely marvelous. No matter where we went, they were lovely. And I will tell you what Shepherdstown is like. One day, I walked into the good shop. I'm looking around, and one of the two lovely ladies that that were running this were there. You know, you're a business owner. And I said, yeah. And she goes, could you do me a favor? <laughs> and I said, sure. And she goes, would you watch the shop for a few minutes? I am really thirsty. I'm going to go up to the end and get it's something. All, to it's all like family. <laughs> <laughs> it's all these family and drug streets to live in. No, no. She goes, you don't have to take any money. Just don't let them run out the place a lot. That's the acceptance is astounding. I love the little quirkiness, just like uh, the person who had the, uh, you know, again, the yellow house, the yellow building next to the antler. Mm -hmm. I went by there once and there was a little sign on the door. It said, be back in four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that in itself is art. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. What was the civil rights movement like in Jefferson? I, I, I have a countywide perspective, perspective on this. John Wesley Harris, the teacher, very respect. He said there was never, we had some rowdy boys in this and that, but there was never, uh, it was, as you can tell, Charlestown had some men who tormented the blacks. Tormented to mean tons of things. And so what I'm saying is a lot meaner in Charlestown. Grover Young was a some really bad guy, so he had to punish Jim uh, Doug Taylor. Jim Taylor's father said, You didn't know how many black guys would beat you about the head. Never ever got to think of that. You know, it, it, was, it was a hardcore over there. That is where the NAACP had its power. So we didn't have a problem. That's the point. You know, there was never, never this. Jim Taylor said the whole thing was to keep you on edge always to keep you fearful and he said we weren't afraid but we just had to get we just had to get along i i have a whole video of him talking so charlestown was a, was a place that needs something and listen don't ever get in the way of a, of a black woman who knows what she's about i swear it wasn't a man it was bertha fox jones Two women from here, Dora Washington and Genevieve Monroe, a woman named Twine. I love this. The guys are like, <laughs> and they come in, they go, George, George Whitley, you're president. No, I'm not. You're president. <laughs> That's how it all started. And they said, when the end of my wife, Doug Taylor, the guy who told me these terrible stories, he saw a clan cross burn in, in front of the courthouse in 1921. He saw it. But he said, when the NAACP came, it all stopped. So it was there, and we didn't need correction. But we, but like we did have segregation. So when it was time, what? I'm with you. Oh. I'm going to have a perspective on what integration is like. Yeah. Because you lived there, right? Well, um, so I lived in Alexandria for a while, and um, remember the Titans movies, all that integration. And that's when I realized that we had integrated here, I can't remember offhand how to calculate, about four or five years earlier mm -hmm. yeah. than Virginia. Huh. Yeah, because I was in seventh grade, yeah, about five years earlier. And um, it was pretty seamless. I mean, we went down to the East Side School where the daycare center is. I went down there for <clears throat> seventh grade when mm -hmm. we integrated. So they had sixth and seventh grade in the black school. They brought in all the black families from uh, Carnesville. And we just integrated. This is, this is what stayed here now. Mm -hmm. And you see, and Ruth, Ruth Brown, a black woman, was one of the great leaders of it for many years. 
that 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 sharing that happens so gracefully. Uh, that's at Charlestown. There's a fight. They did not integrate their schools in about 1965. So totally different. Was there any tension? It must have been about the same time for us. But but Alexandria, Virginia, the remember the Titans was a class uh, senior class of '71. I see. <coughs> so that was pretty late that they integrated a football team. And oh yeah, and, and and what Jim Taylor told me, he was good football player. He's very very highly the Taylor was so regarded by everybody. Long and short is, uh, he said, when we, when we, and I came to Shepherd, I was the first black person to go to Shepherd. He said, the professors were so nice. <laughs> you know, one, one of them was, was uh, John Staley said, Sean Racist views, Mr. Sean, but, but they said they were so welcoming. And uh, there was a time when the football team were on the bus, uh, bus and, and somebody wouldn't let Jim into the restaurant. You know, what that held up the restaurant until we got them in. So we've always had a different thing. Uh, the, the, when was this? Well, that's um, Shepherd, was that the 50s? Yeah, it's in the 50s. Was there any feeling of tension or any anything like you, you imagine when you see segregation, you know, integration? That's a good point of view? I was young and I'm going to whitewash it because that's my point of view, but. Um, I think I remember the Black Power signs and everything was going on in Washington and the riots and all that, and it was a little scary. And um, but here I didn't, I never sensed that, at least from my point of view. But I really didn't sense that we never had, you know, graffiti or a fight. I, it no, just really it, wasn't. It never set up in, in two sides. You expected Shepherd, it to hit, but it just didn't. No, Shepherdson never divides up sides. That's what it is. You just don't even see that. Well, and I think it goes back. So I told you, I came from Phoenix. So, you know, we were pretty integrated out there. A lot of it was just in it's 11, in 10, this, you know, 11, 10. Okay. And uh, this is what it is. So this was, I came back here in summer so of. That really wants. 68. Okay. Eight. Okay. Uh, so I was here, yeah, 60, 69, 68, 69, 70. Um, we moved to Phoenix in 70. No, I was born in Phoenix right. in 1955. Okay. I'm old. <laughs> no, but, but even in 70, Phoenix was not huge. It's it's huge oh, now. Phoenix has changed a lot, too. Yeah. We don't, you know, we're not going to go to the conversation right, right, about right. that. But anyways. When I came back here in the 60s, as sleepy as Shepherdstown was, you know, we, we went to the high school over here. I went to um, eighth and ninth grade at Shepherdstown High School, which is now the, the middle school. Up there. Yeah, and, and when you keep going, but yeah. each town always stayed together right through high school until the mid 50s, mid 70s. And, um, I mean, they're, they're, I, I agree with, with Martha Jane. We were integrated. There was no, there was no, there was no tension. I mean, we had, we had dances in the, in the school, in the gymnasium and things, and you know, the, 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 the basketball teams, the football teams, they were integrated. It was just, it was just the way it was. And I think it goes back to what Jim said about even, you know, back like before and during the Civil War. Even the landed families around here, like the Lees and, and some of the others, well, there was a few exceptions, but by and large, if they had slaves, if they had indentured servants, they didn't have very many, That's and right. they were really treated more like family and, and than they were, you know, pieces of property. Um, they, when, I, when I was asked to house it and leave the first Yankee to house it and leave it, uh, Peggy Grantham was the one who claimed, yeah. who dates way, way back to Edmund, uh, uh, Henrietta Bedinger Lee and Peggy Washington. You know, generations <coughs> most of these. Yeah, I mean, they're just, my Aunt Rebecca had a lady, I don't remember her name, you might know, Jane, who cleaned for Becky? Who cleaned for Becky? She might have cleaned for your mom, too. I think it was back in the yeah. 60s. Yeah. She came once a week. She cleaned the house. We were the girls, me and Susan and Sally, I think we're kind of terrified of her because, like Jim said, <laughs> you, yeah, you didn't mess with the, do you it. You didn't mess with the black woman who knew what she was about, and this one did. 
But it was just, but Becky treated her. I mean, she had lunch with us. Becky fed her. She gave her, you know, she bought her things. She, it was, it was, yeah. it's just part of the culture. I know, and you're, you're they fast. Were, they were all lucky? accepted. Aren't we lucky? Yeah. I was on a walking tour yesterday, um, and the person leading it was singing the praises of Senator Burr and all he's done for the university for Shepherdstown. And it was mentioned that he had been a member of the KKK. Right. I don't know anything about him. Yeah. Did, the answer, was, there, was there a this, reckoning? Did he listen, have the answer to this is I met him. I mean, I had some great moments with him. Uh, I remember him, Martha, I knew Martha Ann, secretary of Martha Ann McIntosh in Sioux and he was hunting on the grass with, and, and, and there he's doing everybody's little constitution thing. And I happen to know this famous quote of Benjamin Franklin from the Constitutional Convention. And Martha Ann brought me up to him and I, and I kind of whispered what Franklin said in his ear. And, and he took my constitution book and he went, so he, here's what Dr. John Staley said about the third. He, he, he was willing to change his mind and he never took a dirty dollar. That's the bottom line. He, he gave, he supported everything the NAACP did. And uh, he, remember everything's personal? Things we got on really, really well with. Again, because he loved history. And neither one. They both low Johnson because they saw what it was. And that's, I think, I think Kennedy had a lot to do with him changing. I mean, Jack Kennedy. Yeah. That's good. But there's, uh, you know, so that, that's always there. And, and, and poor Washington Post, they never knew what to do with him because, his, you know, he's getting all this money and it's not a, it's all this stuff. The only word they could ever use was enigmatic. <laughs> Because they didn't want to say they liked him. And anyway, he's due for a good biography. Just a quick thing on, on the integration topic. This is not racial integration, but in the, <coughs> in the early 70s, there was a regional integration into one high school. So all like the town right. high schools yeah. were shut down. I went to, it was called Jefferson. Yes. And so my uncle, who's like four years younger than you are, he was, I think he said he was either a freshman or sophomore. And he told me that that was actually a really rough time. I think he did one year in Shepherdstown, his sophomore year he went to Jefferson. And he said it was almost, it was really rough for some kids, especially Shepherdstown kids, because they were so kind of nice. And it was, oh, it was it's true. a lot rougher. Like he said, the Shannonvale kids from up on the mountain were like really rough. And they're almost like gang wars at this high school. So like, you know, they were getting beat up and there were these feuds and it's like in the Charlestown boys. Like it was rough for these boys in regional integration, so that lasted for like two years, and eventually everyone started yeah. to know each other. That's a, that's <laughs> see, it's an interesting persistence of values and different kind of the key key clue. See, we should stay throwing these things out, but we, the whole theme what we're doing is what is the reason? I looked at the census tracts. There's like a whole, whole number of census tracts within Shepherd, just Jefferson County in the census, and I know the education level. The Shepherdstown districts have an education level equivalent to, to like Falls Church. 50% or more have degrees, the A's are higher. The rest of the county, you go over towards Ransom, 3%. You go, you go down, mostly through the path all throughout the county, it's kind of like, even in the good subdivisions. So you're attracting retired feds with two pensions and you've got to have a lot of degrees to go to a federal job and then the shepherd education. And there's an education failure. There is, there is. Um, you could not find this many people no matter what you advertise in Charlestown. I know. But there's a huge growth of people coming into Charlestown now because it, it, it's commutable. Um, that's, I mean, it's had, there's a big change, but there's certain walls that see, I see it on the history side. You will never see the Charlestown Historical Society, the Jefferson County Historical Society, do a mailer for new membership. That is the furthest thing from their mind is new shutter members. Truly, I've never had seen them. 
It's almost it's almost a hermetic order. And no, it's it, it's so certain places it just won't budge. But, but here's the thing: it wasn't our great great granddaddy who died in the Civil War. I find a hit on the right thing I, because I was around military people growing up, West Pointers. I finally understood this, and it's this: the only way a person from the North that ever wants to reach anybody in the South with that culture fairly and successfully. The only way is um, I will never, never, I will never be great. I will always honor someone who places their safety, uh, who, who, who risks their life for a cause greater than themselves, even if it's wrong, that they're being, they're being selfish, selfless. And that's what they have to know. That it was noble that they were willing to, and it's not their business to know the details of the cause. That's the private's perspective. Now, the ones you want to hang, Nathan Bedford Forrest, please, slave owner, all during the, before the war, bad news guy, started the clan, you know. Uh, but the long and short is, that's the only way someone will listen to you. Your great, great granddad. You know. I couldn't let go of that. There's a lot of that around you. We had divided families in Jefferson, Jefferson. And the beauty is those divisions never cut so deep to divide all those bonds. But last thing for me, and then go ahead, Mark. I'm tying some threads together. Um, about education and about church and various other things. I, uh, it's interesting to me as a newcomer, you talk about Randy. I had coffee with Randy yesterday, just met him, and we became friends. Yeah, and he has, um, he has no biases, you know. He's, um, we, he was introduced to me by a mutual friend who in, uh, in the context of consulting with me about a book he's writing. Mm -hmm. and, and so my question is having, spent a couple hours with him yesterday and knowing that he was the pastor of the Presbyterian Church for 40 years and where he is now intellectually, I wonder if Shepherdstown has a tradition or history of an intellectual, yes. secular, yes. humanistic Chautauquas, uh, always had Chautauquas. And probably, you know, when you start looking closely, this little nexus of families was like the intelligentsia. Dansky, uh, Charlotte Pendleton, the Pendletons, who was a concert pianist. There were people who traveled and knew languages, and they were like you know, high society. They were very intellectual. Uh, and of course, the college. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what rank, where Randy comes from, that's kind of like my tribe, but I'm not, I have no tribes anymore. But he would marry every misfit in their dwell that no one else would marry. <laughs> Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, I like. I had to use misfit in there to well somewhere. <laughs> the worst rattle element of great people. Um, but he was the new blood. Every old timer is going to say, "I don't know anybody in town anymore." The new people. I think you've all kind of pieced it together. Ira Blackens comes in. Hello, father's William Blackens. Millions of dollars worth of paintings. And I remember him patting around his nice little goatee, and he wore slippers. But he was an expert in apples. He was the editor of the Pomological, the Pomological Spider. And you could see him patting around. And, you know, we always said, we're close. There's Ira. And that whole generation will not, they'll not understand anybody who does not know that when the sun is about this low in the sky, it's time for a strong drink. That's a whole generation thing. <laughs> and I remember sitting with Julia Davis. She goes, Jim, uh, a little ice. <laughs> you know, it's everybody knew what time was. Uh, and I do my little sherry. But the long and short is, um, come on, Jim, we'll get together. Uh, there's, if you're black, and you move out here, you are at a loss. And you're intellectual. I know people like this. Michael Tolbert, 
there's just nowhere to go. And then they move, and maybe you just don't find your tribe. No, but it's, it is interesting <clears throat> that there are very few, if any, African Americans in the in this program, for example. That's exactly right. Um, the, the lifelong learning, they're just, I, I, I know uh, I've been in there for what five or six hours, but one has been here, and I haven't, I don't recall a black fellow student. No, and it's, I'm in the best position to maybe try to break that open. Because I, I one time they just take they said go up, go up and preach Jim. We're gonna need that's great church. Yeah, so but that's you know boy. I'll give you I'll leave it this. They were asking me to do something about the bicentennial of the church, you know, and I was there. And I'm sitting there, I could this is what it was. The person in charge was a very professional woman of color with a federal government background. And she was talking to everybody like an administrator. All the people in the church, very, well, we need this from you. Does anybody have any further? Do this whole structural federal thing? And everybody's kind of like, going like this. They wanted me to tell them about their family history. It would have taken off if we went where they were going, where they wanted to go. But, but the person didn't get it, and it never worked out because they were looking for little technical things about the church. You'll get there through your family. Anyway, it's mysterious in the walls. Who knows? Okay, we're getting here. Is it time? It's 11.24. Five minutes. All right. The thing, there's going to be a video you can watch. I chose, this, this, was this worth it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Wonderful. Yeah, this is reality stuff. I didn't want to do the videos because they, they tend to say, take a long time to say stuff that you don't necessarily need to know. But you can go and see what Shepherdstown was. The video is, is, is uh, on my site, Shepherdstown, September 1921. With music from movie from the uh, 18, from the, from the movie theaters and movies. And it really has a lot of information. And then the second one is the Wadis. I'll send you the text. But I guess we had to get down with real business, didn't we? I hope to see you in the future when we keep doing this. I will see you in a month. In a month? Get right. your registration forms in. <laughs> yeah. I've decided we're going to do the screen and TV thing. And we could decide. You, you, you're you already you know, uh, I have done really good video on the MTV. It is, you know, I've tried, you know, I've tried it. I've tried not to do it. We can do the MTV somehow. Then we're going to do, I think, I'll show the video that Dennis Fry did with Battle of Harper Springs. It is the second most watched video I have out of 500. It's just so well done. Uh, so you got to do those two. I have to tell the story of John Yates Bell, who was who was hanged by Lincoln on Governor Island for, for uh, doing raids, and he was from Charlestown. Um, but, but it's a wonderful kind of odd story because it was in common. You know, he tried, he tried to be mostly, and he just didn't have it. But if you were to read about him, he, he was like, he was like the great, great soldier in the world. Anyway, people things, I don't know, we'll do the rest. Oh, I can't wait to do the one of songs uh, on the songs that they. I, I was interested in, in the fact that you've got these uh, General Mosby raids and stuff like that up here. I, 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 I was associated him with further south. No, no, no. No, Mosby, Mosby, those of us who know, Mosby interests everybody yeah. because you know what they don't know? Well, first off, you got to be interested in the guy that kills somebody in a duel in college. Like, whoa. You know, yeah. you know but he's a, but he was very good at, at raids. And he, the Green Mackery is very famous, which occurred stone throw from the Black Dog Coffee Place. Okay. But the thing is, what I like about him is he went after the war. He said, I, it's over. He said, I didn't own slaves. I, he said, they're my inheritance. That I will never go to any of these reunions. 
you know, selling lost other cause, he never wanted to pick it up because he just didn't know, you know, back in back in the country. Had a, had a job in Japan from, from Grant. So he's one of these clear eight clear eyed guys who saw things clearly. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, you can just email me the classes you want to take. And I'm going to be there next week. Okay. Great. Yeah, I mean, a registration form is, is the best. Yes. We'll make sure. But um, yeah, you can. When you're a gold member, you have email privileges.